how do you read? So right now we have the right mindset, right? The leaders are readers, that reading is your mind, would exercise your body, you have purpose, so you're not reading without intention, right? P times E times S3. And the methodology is, okay, so first first of all, I want to make it easy. Just like you were saying, like, you don't want to get a smart TV and you want you want Netflix to load in split second because you want to make it difficult. And that's part of, you know, designing habits, proper habits. You want to make the things that are not good for you more difficult, like if you don't have your phone by on your nightstand, you know, when you're sleeping, then you're not going to pick it up, right? Yeah. It's like putting it in, in your bathroom is probably a safer place, because, you know, and just like doing the things I like I, I put a, a kettlebell and a chin up bar, right? You know, at the entrance yeah. of my office and I'm just like, I see it and it was just easy to do just like you do something when you're, when you're doing your make your coffee. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's why not make the good things that are good for you easy to do and the things that are not good for you more difficult, you know? So if you are going to get that thing, that, that alcohol, whatever, why don't you put it in the basement in a very difficult place, you know? So you have to, oh man, I don't want to go all the way downstairs and do that or that candy bar or whatever, or just not have it in your home, <laughs> you know, which makes it a lot easier. Just like if you don't, if not good with bread, like it doesn't agree with you and you're at a dining table, you know, and they bring you bread, you could either look at that bread and say, no, 20 times in your mind throughout that whole evening yeah. or you could just say no when they bring it to you and yeah. then you don't have to say no every single time you use up all that 100%. energy and tension. Yeah. So going back to the power of purpose, I'm the same way with my reading, right? And I set up my environment just like you do. I have books specifically around and I do read multiple books at, at, at a time and I'm a big fan, you know, especially the past few years of reading fiction books. Um, it's a lot of times I'm, I'm, I obsess about nonfiction. I'm like, what's the purpose in this? I want to read a books on, you know, on, on neuroscience, adult learning theory. Um, and, and I've seen so many benefits of reading fiction and even research shows it, it improves empathy, um, you know, character development, imagination, yeah. uh, problem solving, pattern recognition. It also, it, it also, um, improves your EQ. You know, where we're reading maybe something else is your IQ. This is more your your emotional quotient. Mm -hmm. um, and so I also schedule my reading. And so I, I'll say this. So I mentioned that it takes about, if you're, if you're a basic reader, 200 words per minute, then um, you get through a book 45 minutes a day. So I schedule that. And I recommend everyone schedule. Because if you don't schedule your workout or you don't schedule your meditation, I mean, we schedule a parent-teacher meetings and doctor's appointments and investor meetings or client team meetings, whatever, but we're not scheduling our own growth. So, so you, you've said, I think before, reading is a workout for your mind. Is yeah, that what you said? I, I think reading is to your mind what exercises is to your body. So, yeah. so then if we use that analogy and go, yeah, you scheduled your physical workouts, yeah. you need to also schedule your mental workouts. Yeah, and I think some people don't, even, don't schedule the physical workouts and they don't get to it. And so they want, because life fills up those yeah. voids and then you, it's at night and it's, it's after dinner, like, oh, I forgot to work out or I just don't have the energy to work yeah. out. And that's the thing is prioritizing the most important things, keep the most important things, the most important things. And I think <laughs> top of that is self-care, you know, and self-care is not just, you know, working out. I think also part of self-care is self-love. You know, we started that in the beginning of the conversation that part of our journey is, you know, looking in the mirror and falling in love with that person looking back that's been through so much, but is, but is mm -hmm. still standing, right? Just like how you're saying, if you love yourself, you're not going to, I mean, this uh, like, if you really deeply care about yourself, you're not going to do things that would potentially harm it by eating certain things mm -hmm. or, or, or otherwise, just like you wouldn't do that things for someone you love. And just if you love somebody else, and I would say no amount of love from somebody else is going to give your soul what it needs from you, right? Yeah. The love and caring and compassion you need from you. And I'm not saying it's easy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, and this whole thing, nothing I'm saying is necessarily easy. I, I would do say it's simple, but simple doesn't mean yeah. easy, right? And so what I would do is schedule it because if you don't schedule, I think the number one productivity performance tool we have is our calendar, right? But if you don't put it down in your calendar, it's not, it's likely not going to get done. So I would schedule that 45 minutes or 20 minutes of reading, whatever you're committed to, you know, also as well. Um, when you have a book, if you're reading, okay, so you prefer analog. And if you're watching this on video, you know, I'm just grabbing my book, yeah. you know, so like even basic things, right? When I'm looking at this, and I, and I open up the book, when I'm looking at it at this angle here, so I'm, I'm taking the book and I have it flat on the table uh, for those who are just listening to this. If I'm looking at this angle from where I'm sitting, I'm sitting upright, then the, the, the words appear 
smaller at this angle because I'm looking at it at an angle. And now some people, what they'll do unconsciously to make it easier for them to read is they'll slump over like this so they could see the words better. But when I did that, what happens? I go into this kinesthetic posture, which is slower than visual posture. I, I collapse my diaphragm, which we talked about is also the key to getting mm. more oxygen to your brain. That's why people fall asleep when they're reading often because of their, their physiology is affecting wow. their psychology. I would also say when you're reading something and, I'm a, and you're going through enjoying this, number one, have an intention. Why, why are you reading this book? Because the fastest way to read something is not to read it at all. Right. So if you ever read a page in a book and got to the end, just like nothing registered, maybe you don't have questions. Going back to the reticular activating system, how a part of it is initialized by questions. So it's kind of like a long time ago, you know, maybe 20 years ago, my, my, my sister would send me these uh, pictures and email postcards of a very specific kind of dog, breed of dog, pug dogs, right? Mm -hmm. These kind of smushy, fun dogs, with smushy faces. And um, they're very compliant. You could dress them as like ballerinas and they're just, oh, whatever. Um, and, and, and I was like, why? My question was, why is she sending me these? And she's a good marketer because she's seeding because her birthday is coming up, right? And I was like, okay. And funny thing happened. When I started asking the question, I started seeing these pug dogs everywhere. Like I'd be at the grocery store checking out and the person in front of me is holding a pug dog. Mm -hmm. And I'm running in my neighborhood and somebody's walking six pug dogs on a leash. And my question for everyone listening is, did these pug dogs magically appear in my neighborhood? And no, of course not. But I wasn't paying attention because again, your brain is primarily a deletion device, right? So we're not shining mm -hmm. a spotlight. And so we, it's in the dark for us. And so, but once I started asking the question, I just started seeing the pug dogs everywhere. And so my question for everyone listening is what are your dominant questions? You know, my dominant question was how do I be invisible? So I got really good ideas on how to shrink and not be seen in class. And that was my result. You know, a dominant question I talk about in the book is uh, a friend of mine found out her dominant question out of the 60,000 thoughts, some of them are questions, the one she asks all the time, how do I get people like me? And you don't know anything about her, but you know, you know her career, what she lived, but you know a lot about her. Someone's obsessed with how do I get this person to like me? That's the question they're asking. What, what's their life like, their personality? You know, they're, they're a martyr, people take advantage of them, they're mm -hmm. a sycophant, their personality changes depending on who they spend time with because they want to be liked. Um, and it's interesting, you know, like you don't know anything about her, but you know a lot about her because you know the question. And my principle here that I'm talking about, questions are the answer. You know, like the, the, the example I put in the book with Will Smith, and you know, I train a lot of actors how to speed read scripts, memorize lines, and I'll give you some of the speed reading tips in a moment, just because these, these illustrations, these stories stick with people. Um, we were tr brain training during the day, we're in Toronto in the winter, in the evening, he's shooting his movie, right? Superhero movie. And it is cold and it is not, people think it's very sexy and very thrilling to be on a movie set, but it's, it's really just people <laughs> just waiting all the time. And during this waiting outside, his family is there and I'm there outside and we're, we're freezing, just kind of watching these monitors underneath this tent. And he's bringing us hot chocolate that he made himself, even though there's a crew that can make it for him. And, and you know, he, and he's uh, cracking jokes and telling stories. And I found out earlier that day, his dominant question is, how do I make this moment even more magical? How do I make this moment even more magical? And I realized that evening, you know, he was demonstrating that question at that time uh -huh. by making the hot chocolate and cracking. He's just bringing more magic into it, you know. And my, my dominant question could be like, you know, what's the best use of this moment, right? I mean, you know, you, you read the book uh, Zero to One by Peter Thiel. You know, he says like, you know, if you had to reach your 10-year goal, but you were only given six months to do it, how would you go about doing it? And you ask a different question, you're going to get a way different answer, mm -hmm. right? And so my, my question for everyone listening, what do you think your dominant question is? Because that determines your focus and that focus determines how you feel and what you do and what you experience in your life. Do you have your dominant question? Yeah, for the longest time it was, how do I make this better? Because remember, I felt like I was broken. So my dominant question came out of my struggle. So I was like, how do I make this better? Right? It's a very empowering question that, isn't it? It, it is because then I start shining a light and saying, oh, there's a pug dog, there's a pug dog, there, there's an answer, there's an answer, there's an answer. But even within the question is the energy of agency. Like it's mm -hmm. built into the question. That's why for me, it's such a wonderful question. Yeah. It's, 
you can't adopt a victim mindset with a question like that. Yeah, and that's and that's great. I got goosebumps again because that's again I call them truth bumps because the, the presupposition is you do have the power to make it better, mm. right? And so people could ask a question like, "How do I make the most of this moment?" Right? The three questions I ask when I read, going back to the reading nonfiction, preparing for a podcast, how can I use this? Why must I use this? When will I use this? So think about the power if you're reading something and not normally getting, you know, maybe 10% of what you think you could get out of it. If you start reading something, a book on health and wellness, on, on glucose and whatever you happen to reading, how can I use this? Then you're like, oh, there's, there's a pug dog, there's a pug dog, there's a pug dog, right? Just like in when I teach students how to do well in standardized tests, like reading comprehension, you know, I always tell them, go read the questions at the end first and then start reading the the, the reading mm. comprehension. Then you're like, because then you know what the author is looking for. Then you have answer, there's answer, there's answer. Why read all this, get to the end and not, and they're like, oh, that's what was important, right? And so you ask your question. So in the beginning of my book, every single chapter starts with three primary questions to activate their reticular activating system. So they're looking for that answer. Mm. So when they read it, they're like, oh, there's a pug dog, there's a pug dog, there's a pug dog. So three questions I ask every day of my life, especially when I'm in learning mode, how can I use this? Right, then I'm like, there's the answer there. I could use it this way, this way, this way, this way. Why must I use it? So it goes my head to my heart, so I have purpose, right? I think about all the Mm. rewards and how my business, my podcast will be better, my book will be better. How can I use this? Why must I use it? Because without reasons, you won't get the results. Just like asking, why do I remember the person's name? And then I say, when will I use this? And that's the scheduling. Because I going back to the lie, limited idea, entertain, the knowledge is power. It's not, it's potential power because power when we utilize it. I have a primary belief that every hour you spend listening to a podcast like this, to be fair, you should spend an equal hour putting it into action. Right. Every hour you spend reading a book, every hour you spend in a lecture, you should spend an equal hour putting it into play. Right. And that I think that because otherwise nothing happens. If nothing, if nothing changes, nothing changes. Right. I want to get yeah. really like fundamental. And then when will I use this? And then I schedule it. I'm like, oh, this is a great thing. I know why I should use this. And then I schedule like, oh, I'm going to do this. Yeah. You know, do this. Add this part to my podcast here. So one of the ways in which people can get better at reading mm-hmm. is by asking the right questions beforehand. Yeah. Like I, what I'm thinking about is, is let's say someone's bought a book that they heard a guest on a podcast, so I'm going to buy that book, yeah. but the book hasn't been read yet, but they took the action, they bought mm-hmm. it. And some days they're trying to look at it and they're probably reading the same page over and over yeah, again yeah. that and they just can't move forward with it. So why might that be? Well, I don't know. To me, it's like, okay, you could be tired, right? Yeah. So nothing's going in that day. It could be that the book was poorly written, mm-hmm. right? So therefore, it's not you, it's actually the the book isn't that well written, which mm-hmm. does happen. Mm-hmm. Um or I'm guessing it could be that you're not you've not primed yourself in the right way to read it. Is that is that sort of how you would yeah. look at it? And then, and and built in everything you just said again, uh, personal responsibility and agency. It, it's it's there, you know. Even even if it's not a book and it's a lecture, I'll even find I'll notice I'll control my state. Like I have to. I go to a lot of conferences. I speak for a good part of my living, and I can be on three continents in one week. We're in front of two hundred fifty thousand people a year, usually at live events. And I could be sitting in the audience waiting to go on and somebody else is speaking on something in the industry. And um, and I could see the effect by looking at people around me as they're falling asleep, right? Mm, We've all yeah. been at lectures like this or even in, in school. <laughs> and and, and, but, and I'll, I'll take agency. I, I honestly, I will do this. Uh, just not, not because I'm so enlightened. It's just I don't want to be bored. Right? I want to control how I feel because I'm a thermostat. I'm not a thermometer. I don't want to be bored just because I'm reacting to people. And I'll, like, I'll, I'll change my mindset. I'm like, wow, this is fascinating. How's this dude like putting everybody to sleep all at the same time? And I'll actually get curious and I'll get energized thinking about that. But that's how I'll entertain myself. Even, you know, or if I'm in a movie and I have to stay in the movie and I don't, I, you know, I don't want to leave because I have family there or, or friends, I'll just like think about other things about how I could apply this and use this and, and so on. Because I'll, I'll, I'll take responsibility for how I feel and, and what I'm thinking and, and what I'm doing. We could always control our mindset, our motivation, which are our feelings, yeah. and the methods, our behaviors. So the same situation's going on, but your experience of that situation now becomes 
very yeah. different, doesn't it? Very, very good. And and not written, just like if a book is poorly written, I could try to find the gems there or I could take responsibility and say, I'm, this is not a book, it's not for me. And that's still my agency. I could walk out of that movie yeah. or, the, or walk out of that speech or anything else. So I start with having the right questions and have purpose. Like I, I read with intention or I listen with intention, right? People aren't randomly listening to your show. They, they, they could because they like you, right? And they know you offer mm-hmm. value and they would get even more if they if they thought like, oh, like what are the kind of questions that I have so I could have, because you pull information inside here by asking questions, right? And if you don't have those questions, nothing's going to register because you can't push information in somebody's head, right? A podcast can push information, but you could pull it in. Yeah, it's interesting, Jim. I've maybe for two or three years now on the audio version, so not the YouTube version, on the Mm -hmm. audio version when I record my outros, I always say, you know, what's one thing you can take away from yeah. this conversation and start applying into your life? And I do that very intentionally because it's like, okay, you've heard a lot. Yeah. You've hopefully been inspired, but let's just make it one thing. What's one thing yeah. you can take away and apply? But as I was um, researching you for this conversation, you talk about the importance of you know, you've already mentioned how much we retain, how much we forget Mm -hmm. within 48 hours. And you talk about the importance of teaching it when you teach it to someone else. So I was thinking maybe for next season, I might um, tweak my outro to be, instead of just one thing you can apply and what's one thing you can teach someone else about what you learned. Do you know, do you think that would make a difference? Yeah, I think think both, both make it maybe rich, but if you want to single one out and people could test this because everyone's a little bit different, but I I learned so I could teach, right? And I, I have a philosophy that when you teach something, you get to learn it twice. And I also feel like we teach the things we most want to learn. That's a different subject because I want to, I was a poor learner, right? And my struggle became my strength. And uh, so I teach other people how to learn. I think that if you give someone an idea, you enrich their life. But if you teach someone how to learn, they can enrich their own life. Kind of like that old, like uh, learn how to fish. Yeah. And so what I would say is, yeah, absolutely. If you want to learn, okay, so when you're reading this book, have a purpose for doing so, you know, notice that I just want to close this out, that if I... If I'm not going to bend my body, and if you're not watching this video, I have the book again um, on the tabletop, and I'm I'm my I'm in visual posture, meaning I'm upright and I'm breathing properly, and I don't want to see it at an angle. So instead of collapsing my body, I just want to close this loop. Then you can just move the book, right? So now I could see the book and at an angle, I can even rest it on the table or rest it on my knee. And that makes a difference. It does because wow. over time, especially if you're reading faster, you know, part of what keeps people reading slowly is just visual fatigue. Yeah. Right. So if, if the if the book is at an angle, then it's the words are smaller, so more difficult to read logically. Yeah. But if they're tilted towards me, then all of a sudden they they are noticeably larger and easier to read. Right. Yeah, I love that. And then I have questions, you know, that I'm asking. So then I say, oh, there's an answer. There's an answer. There's an answer. So I never get in a situation where I read something and I just forget what I just read or not, didn't understand it. It just like time passed when you in one eye out the other or whatever. And then I'm asking questions. Now that, that's for smart reading, but for speed reading, if you want greater speed, like like all we teach is not it's not skimming or scanning. Like we work with a lot of attorneys, a lot of financial advisors, a lot of medical doctors. You don't want your you don't want your doctor to get the gist of what they're, you know, what she they're reading, right? <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I don't. So you know, so a lot of traditional speed reading is scanning, skipping words, getting the uh, gist of what you read, right? And that 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 that's never worked for me because I started as a memory trainer. So one of the ways you can improve your reading speed is first of all, get your base rate, all right? So I would say put a mark in the margin, pick up a book that you're reading or a brand new book, put a little mark in the margin where you're starting uh, currently today. It might be somewhere in there. And then read for 60 seconds. Set a timer, your phone to go down for 60 seconds and have it ring. And then put a mark in the margin where you left off. So in 60 seconds. And then count the number of lines you just read. And it counts, you know, you could guesstimate, right? So don't, if there's two words in a line, don't count it as a line. And then you have your lines per minute, right? That's how many lines you read in a minute. And you could easily also kind of approximate how many words there are per line. And most books you'll find about 10 words per line, right? If I was to count or average the, the average number of words per line, mm-hmm. about 10. So let's say you go through and you read like 20 lines in, to simplify it in 60 seconds, 200 words per minute, right? Then that's by the way, about the average reading speed, about 200, 250 words per minute. Now, if I ask you to pick up where you left off, 
and put the clock on 60 seconds again, pick up where you left off, but just do one thing different is what I'm going to ask you to do is just underline the words with your finger or a pen, not, not you're actually not marking it, but just like use it as a visual pacer. And a visual pacer is, it could be a pen, a highlighter, a mouse on a computer, right? I use my finger because everyone carries them with them, right? So you don't have to worry about them. You have them at all, at all times. If you just underline the words, right? You don't even have to touch the page. And you did that for 60 seconds and count the number of lines you just read, that second number will be on average 25, 50% or more. So, okay, I love mm-hmm. this. So you, you you read one section to get your baseline. Right. Then you, you're you not rereading that. No. You go into a new you section. Pick up, so you're putting a mark in the margin where you start yeah. and where you end, count the number of lines and you have your base rate. And then the second time, all you're doing is as you're reading the new uh, mm-hmm. piece of, uh, or yeah. the new words, where you left off. you're just underlining with your finger. Yeah. You're just going Keywords. under nine. You're not, yeah, exactly. You're just going left to right, left to right, left to right, right, back, left to right, back to left, and not right. And you're just not everything, every, just keywords. Every, every, no, no, you're not marking it. You're just literally using your finger and going right underneath and like this. Exactly. Oh, the whole like thing. This. Yes, just like this. And you're just following your eyes across the page like this. Wow. I'm telling you, you don't have to believe everything I'm saying. Everyone, listen, just pick up a book and do it and then count the number of lines you did, even without practice. You haven't even practiced this, but if you practice, it'll even be more. And I'll tell you why logically, because as human beings, you know, we want the explanatory schema, the reasons why. A couple of reasons. First of all, kids naturally, when they're learning to read, will use their finger while they read mm. to help them to focus. Until, depending on what kind of school system you want, you got unique feedback. Some people got a ruler to their hand or whatever because, you know, they wanted, and I'm not saying that I'm, there's a conspiracy trying people not to use their finger because they want to keep people ill informed or anything. I'm not saying that. But if you just use your, it's interesting, kids organically will use it, you use their fingers to help them focus. Um, interesting also, we do it. So, I, when you do this, notice when I ask you to count the number of lines you just read, everyone will start with doing what? Using their finger to point one, two, three, four, five, or a pen, one, two, three, mm. because you're using a visual pacer to count because you know it helps you to focus. So why not use that while you read? The third reason why you use your finger while you read or a visual pacer, again, you can be using a, you know, a pen across, you're not marking it, right? You're just going right above the line is because your eyes are attracted to motion. Because as hunter and gatherers, like if you're in a bush and you're hunting lunch, right? There's a rabbit there, or there's carrot, whatever your lunch is, right? If a bush next to you moves, you have to look at what moves because that's survivor, survival. It, number one, it could be lunch or number two, you could be lunch, right? So you have mm-hmm. to look at what moves in your environments. And so when you're underlining the words across the page, left to right and back and forth, your eyes are being pulled through the information as opposed to your attention being pulled apart. Mm-hmm. Right. And the other reason why, because right now, if something, someone just walked across the room that we're in, everyone would look, even people watching on video, right? You and I, all of us, because your eyes are attracted to motion. So when your finger is going across the page, your attention is being pulled through it and it maintains your focus. But the, another reason, if we didn't, that wasn't reason enough, it's how your neurology is set up. Certain senses work very closely together. So, for example, do you love like a, a, a fresh piece of fruit? Like not like right off the vine, right it's from the farmer's market. Not something that's been sprayed in wax and sitting in a store for six months, but something yeah, like- for sure. Have you ever tasted a great tasting uh, peach? Yeah. Yeah. And so in actuality, we're not tasting that peach. We're, we're, we're what, are we, what are we doing? We're smelling that peach. The tongue is not capable of really tasting what a peach tastes like, but the sense of smell and taste are so closely linked that your mind can't perceive the difference. It can perceive the difference when we're sick. If your nose is congested, what do a lot of foods taste mm. like? Tastes bland, right? Yeah. Because your sense of smell and taste are so closely linked. Wow. So is your sense of sight and your sense of touch in your nervous system. So like if, like, um, you know, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have a newborn baby, you know, if I was, to, and starting to like, you know, grasp, if, but if you're going to infant and take your keys and just sh- shook the keys in front of the infant or, you know, that who understands and say, look at, look, look, look at these keys. What would, what would the child naturally do? Grab them, right? Mm. Because that they associate looking with, with touching, right? In fact, when people read using their finger, they say they feel more in touch with their reading yeah. over time. Oh, here's, here's another way. If someone loses their sense of sight, how do you read? 
use your braille. braille touch, right? And so I would encourage everyone to do is just a, just a kind of a, a quick tip because obviously, you know, we, we do trainings, 30 yeah, days. Yeah, you do trainings. full yeah. courses that people yeah, can sign uh, up for. Yeah, 10 minutes a day for 30 days and we'll triple anyone's reading speed with much better comprehension. But even if you just underline the words while you read, you'll feel not only greater speed, a lift of 25, 50%, but you'll feel more in touch with your reading also as well, especially if you're adding the questions and everything else we yeah. talked about. And so I would say everyone could experiment with that. There's, if people, can I give a link? Yeah, sure. If people go to jimquick.com forward slash more, kwik.com forward slash more, there's actually a free one hour masterclass where you can, I'll actually work and walk you through it. You bring a book online and I'll show you how to do this visually and I'll show you some really cool shortcuts, but that will boost your reading speed 25, 50%. And that does, that's not a little bit, that's a lot. That's a lot. Right? If they say time is money, how many people got a 25, 50% return on their investments last year, right? So it, it really adds up over time and little by little, a little becomes, it becomes a whole lot. If you enjoyed that clip, here's another powerful clip that I think you are really going to enjoy. 